This is Philosophy versus Improv, where two sages try to teach each other a thing or two, and maybe you, the audience, get something out of it as well. My name is Mark. I will be your improv instructor today. And this is Bill. I will be your philosophy instructor today. I just thought I'd switch it up a little bit because I feel like I've gained some uh, <laughs> proficiency with improv. I, I could probably teach, maybe not you, something, unless... What is really to be taught is a special individual thing that each one of us has. And so, yes, you can teach me your improv, but I can teach you my improv. And vice, same with philosophy, maybe. Maybe it's just all personal. Well, yeah. Is that the lesson for today or are you improvising? I'm connecting <laughs> something that I actually just said by accident at the beginning here because I didn't have an intro prepared <laughs> to... Something that I was thinking about, but we can we can let that emerge. That is the nature of this activity is that Bill knows a bunch of tricks and tips and uh, gestures, tools. Apparatus. You've actually stumbled on something kind of interesting in the improv world. That is this idea of like music. There's lots of different styles. You know, I know you also dabble in the musical far more than dabble in the musical profession. Uh, here we go. Here's philosophy. What makes a certain song, a certain genre. If we take a country and Western song and I don't sing it twangy, is it still a country and Western song? Or if I don't use classic guitar tuning of a country, and you know, at what point does it stop being a country and Western song? So I think you know the answer to that <laughs> using, I believe we've talked before about Wittgenstein's reaction against definitions in terms of necessary and sufficient conditions. Does that sound familiar? You said it very formally. So, so his thing is like, we shouldn't define things by formal conditions. Is that what you're saying? Instead, there are paradigm cases and okay. there are borderline cases. And that's the way most concepts work. It's not every concept. The number pi, that's pretty specific. It's not, you're either pi or you're not pi. Sure. And there are lots of things we can define with exactitude. But most concepts that arise naturally, chairs. I mean, this is obviously a chair I'm sitting in. But what if I'm sitting on a rock? Sure. Uh, so it, it becomes just a matter of like, well, why do you care? I mean, sometimes it matters, you know, if, sure. if the typical person that we give moral weight to is a talking adult like us. Well, what about really young things? What about non-human animals? What about fetuses? Do they count? You know, we could get into all sorts of things. It really does matter. There's a reason to fight about these borderline cases. I'm not saying it's just all bullshit. Sure. But it is social. If you ask for a chair and I give you a penny, that's very much not a chair. Right. And in fact, I shouldn't say it's all social because that would imply that we could just socially create any old concept that we wanted. And while I could right now define, uh, I'm going to call blip a thing that's pennies or chairs. That doesn't get at any, any, the essence of anything. And there really could be some concepts where we could uh, yes. be arguing about it. Like, what is the essence of a country music song? Well, it's got to have sorrow it's got to be geographically tied to the heartland somehow it certainly can't be fully on urban whatever that means mm -hmm. but then you know unless you're keith urban if you're keith urban point made <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the same thing is true in improv a little bit and there's this funny thing that happens at improv festivals where there'll be a town that will have an improv festival and they'll invite performers and maybe some noteworthy teachers from around the country and the world to come and do shows for each other and teach a workshop or two. And there is often a, an all-star show. Some of the stronger teams kick in a few players. And if some of the visiting workshop instructors, they kick in a few players and you've got eight to 10 to 12, presumably talented, experienced for sure, players doing some kind of all-star show. They are often entertaining on the outside. On the inside, they are often infuriating. If improv is all about agreement and yes and, you would think the most agreeable. The agreement Olympics. Yes. No, it is often the, I got to get my piece in there. I got to get myself in there and prove that I deserve to be here or suffer the consequences. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But they, they are often wild jumbled messes now these are generally talented people who who can be quite funny sometimes despite improvising poorly which is an interesting little mm. fun fact so i think it's this idea let's say you were to have a musical 
jam. Hey, we're going to invite some friends over. And, you know, we got a guy who plays guitar. We got someone on some drums and we got a pianist and, 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 you know, some guy who plays a clarinet. And another guy that just has a feather. We're not really sure how that works, <laughs> yeah, but it's, exactly. you know. Does he tickle himself? Tickle someone else? What's going on? Does he rub it across a tambourine with a microphone right up there? But if everyone's trying to play a different style of music, does it, is there dissonance? Is there unconstructive dissonance as opposed to intentional artistic dissonance? Does that make sense? It does. And maybe the solution, which, which is in line with what I was thinking of talking about today is, is that uh, you shouldn't collaborate. We should not collaborate. Because the, the piece of art comes from an individual mind. It, it needs to grow organically as this. And, and maybe you could get on the same page. You know, you could maybe up, try to approximate that with uh, mm-hmm. more than one human being. But, you know, it's always going to work better, says Ayn Rand, author of The Fountainhead. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever read The Fountainhead, but The Fountainhead, I, I put myself through listening to this as an audiobook at some point is about an architect who yes. like doesn't like that his boss will like go put sconces on his nice drawings. He thinks his drawings are just fine as they are. Cause it's, sure. it's yeah, it's, it's foreign elements, as you were saying, coming in different styles. Ah, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. John Galt. Is that, is that the fountainhead? Uh, that's the other book. The other one. <laughs> Alice shrugged. Okay. Yes. The fountainhead was the yeah. warm up. Fountainhead is like much thinner. And you, okay. could, you could actually stand it, even though every character in it is despicable and it's so dated. Sure? But no, Atlas Shrugged is the one that you just want to never... You never attempt. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, you know, it's kind of funny. This happens a lot in the improv world where I used to do a lot of business seminars, improv workshops. I think I organized a few, but I was usually a co-instructor on the teaching staff. And there was one we did at a, at a university business school. A nice business school, not Ivy League. Let's say second tier Ivy business school where all of the second year business students had to come home a week early to MBA students to do some little workshops and seminars. Oh, there's one about workplace behavior. Oh, there's another one about, you know, all kinds of topics. And one of these things was this improv workshop. And you could just look around the room immediately as to how people were interested in doing this. Anybody in the HR or marketing was on board. Anybody in finance hated it and just did not want to be there from the word go. And it was always very funny to me and funny for us to be like this whole notion of, of certainly marketing and sales. You know, those people were much more apt to work together and, and be involved in something. But the finance people just, I mean, it's not like a team runs the numbers. You run the numbers and then you may give the numbers to somebody else or someone checks over your numbers. But the work of accounting is at times insanely personal and private. However, the work of marketing, the point is to consider other people. (laughs) It's literally intrinsic to marketing. Now, Bill, I see you didn't agree with my numbers that I came up with, but you just don't get me. What? Uh, Mark, these are, if we're we're starting a scene right now, Mark, these are just the numbers. I I gave you a stack of receipts that had been turned in late and they're, they're just, they're not reflected on the numbers. I mean, is there no discretion? Is there no room for style for giving it my own Flare, you can put this in whatever font you want to put it in. You want to put the margins set to five inches on each side. Go for it, man. But the numbers are the numbers. So if you could just take this back, like I said, I got that pile of receipts. Sorry, they were late being turned in, but these need to be reflected. Those receipts need to be reflected. This is an artificial distinction between form and content here. You're saying I can liven up the form, which realistically, I think if I did give you something in a a Comic Sans, you would you probably not appreciate that, but uh, you know. I would be more appreciative of a Comic Sans finance report that was accurate numerically. The calculations were accurate then. I mean, isn't accurate kind of like adequate? Like, don't you want more? More accurate. More than accurate? More than, hey, we're round to the nearest penny. That's as, that's as far as we need to go. But what's, what's, what's the deal here? Do you not, do you not, are you busy? Do you not want to d- do this work? Did you be just a lot of pushback here? So last time, you mm-hmm. didn't like when I came up with much like I, I believe it was Brahms. Uh, yes. You know, when I came up, you gave me the, the prompt and I came up with uh, 27 different variations. The next day you said, no, 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 just just give me one. Give me one. So I picked the one that I thought was the most pleasing. You know, it might not have all the numbers that you think are required, but some numbers just they don't they don't fit 
in the set. They're like coming from a different place. I mean, these receipts, we're talking about a tech company here. So this receipt that's like what for fake mustaches for the tech company improv outing, like that's bullshit. I'm not including that. I'm not including that. It is A and B. You need to include it. It's gauche. How could you even, I mean, probably it's probably even against the law. Okay. Well, look, that's, that's your opinion of the comedy mustaches. That's your opinion of them. All right. However, the accountant's job is to take everything into account. Wouldn't perfection be taking everything into account? Okay. Then we should take into account the time and effort. What about the spouses of the accountants of, of the people in the company? Their significant others may or may not be married who, who do work from home. There's no accounting of that. Like, it seems like you're devaluing. I'm sorry you picked this vocation. I really am. Clearly, you're unhappy. Clearly, you need something where you can express your individuality better and more to your liking. Clearly, this is not the right job for you. You can understand that, right? What about if we just make every final number a prime number? That would feel really rich. Can you imagine the irony? Do I even need to explain it to you? I know what irony is. I'm well aware of what irony is. I don't see how it is ironic that all the numbers are are prime. I mean, it's just the final number. Like if you could have any other numbers, but if it all in the end ends up in a prime number, I mean, who would even expect that? It creates a distance between the viewer and the work that really allows you to, you don't want to get too sucked up in the numbers. And then, because then it becomes all business. You know what, Mark? Here's what we'll do. Okay, you want to express yourself? I mean, this is what it's about. It's about self-expression, right? There's no other reason to not do math accurately other than self-expression. I can think of no other. That's a very imperialist kind of word. Hey, whatever you want to label it. I think if by some of the definitions of accurate, you're totally marginalizing whole segments of the population. What about people that have never taken a math class? Do you feel that it's fair to marginalize their points of view and say math is an absolute thing. One plus one is always two. It needs to be. It needs to be two. I mean, I guess I feel a little sorry for you. Here's here's what we're going to do. All right. Here's what we're going to do. Okay. You come up with that final number. All right. Find the nearest prime that is larger yet closest to that number. Okay. Mm -hmm. It could be five cents. Could be three. It could be whatever. Some small number. All right. And I'll just chip that in to the budget, okay? And we'll we'll make it a prime number, okay? You're saying you're gonna you're gonna fudge the final if we have to add an extra thirty seven cents, okay? Man. I'll take it out of petty cash, or right, it'll be a refund from petty cash, okay? All right, if you want to, yeah. And then you get you get to end everything. In I a mean, prime. but I'm not. I don't want co authorship. I mean, I want I want my name on it. No one will know. No one will know. It will be a line item. A deduction from petty cash. Actually, if given that you're going to impose this extra oh, little deduction, why don't you just put your oh, name on it? Just oh, put your okay. name on it. I'm not going to. I Fine. I do all the work, and then you just put the little final thing, and and okay. just you just take it under your. It, it's yours. You got it. All right, we'll do. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so much juice in that initial idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's that whole thing. At some point, you just got to wonder. We have all met, certainly met people who have a my way is right attitude about things, yet insist on putting themselves in positions where they have to work with other people. It's like, look, you want to write a story, go for it. No one's stopping you. You can make it do whatever you want. But in this particular context, we have to work together. There are certain contexts I feel like that require cooperation. You know what I'm saying? Have you met that person? Yeah, yes. Bring it back to you were starting to tell me about sort of the final round of these improv things where then the best of the best from the thing are against, you know, are, are trying to collaborate, but that this uh, maybe being part of that pool, one of the qualities that would make you even qualify for that is that you are a selfish piece of shit and that you. <laughs> Ouch. (laughs) You can't play well with others, even though... You would think those would be the best players with others. That's kind of gross. Players with others, a new podcast, a new improv (laughs) podcast. A great example of that to kind of demonstrate what this means would be there are two, there are some differing school of thoughts. One is the take care of yourself school of thought, 
which is, and again, there's no judgment here. It's which is, Mark, the best thing I can tell you as a scene partner is who I am, what you should expect from me. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I was just, uh, I don't know if you uh, saw the uh, softball team uh, sign up sheet. Uh, you know, it's not about the sign up sheet. It's about this kind of milk toast guy who wants you to do something. And that's the best thing I can do for you is tell you who I am. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to be so offensive against high talkers. <laughs> yeah, that's element, one of the many elements. <laughs> but the other school of thought might be to start with some kind of premise. As the person who might be playing second in a scene, say I initiate, you are then maybe have a choice. It's like, do I follow Bill's premise or do I create my own character? If the best thing I can do for my partner is to let them know who I am, Maybe I should choose to be somebody. So often those two things are not in agreement with each other. Someone has some initiation and I can create my own person and jam it down, you know, whatever it is that you're mm -hmm. trying to, you're trying to create. Now, sometimes if I'm not trying to create anything heavy or big, it's, it's quite welcome. But if I have a very specific thing in mind that I would like to do, kind of a follow me initiation, we've been talking about some philosophical thing and it makes me think of an idea that could very, very much explore that philosophical notion, well, then it would be nice if you would follow me. <laughs> and I'll start wildcatting. Yes, follow and compliment. So that suggests, I don't know if this goes with your lesson, but you know, maybe you start a scene and I will attempt not to just create some fucking character and ram it down your throat, but <laughs> to, and not just agree with you, it has to be some kind of, probably what I should have been doing every single scene, but that I generally don't. Believe it or not, Mark, I think <laughs> you actually typically do follow pretty well, mm. even if you have your own spin or take. If anything, I think it'd be more fun for you to start to try being some big people right out of the gate. That actually might be kind of a fun thing to do. I can have kind of a fairly light initiation. You can come super strong with a person. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. Well, they said the, they're not going to start renting canoes for another hour. So we're going to be right here for another hour. Son of a bitch. I, I, I'm not into that. What? Well, 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 just, well, just, well, you know, we, we still got the cooler beer. There, let's just pound some cold ones. We'll get on the water. We'll get fishing. Don't worry about it. All right. All right. Just, uh, I got to Just f fucking hungry for those, f f those fish. They, they're calling to me. Yeah. We'll get on the water, dude. Now. We don't need all of this fancy technology to get on the water. We could just go. A canoe? Okay, dude, well, if you want to talk to the guy, feel free. But he said that they're just not, they don't have the key or something. He had something. He just said, we're not renting canoes for another hour. I didn't press. I didn't press. You know what? I got a credit card. Let's just buy one. You want to go buy a canoe? Yeah. Really? I mean, then we'll return it. <laughs> return, return it wet. <laughs> Say, this, Look, this, I, this was no good. <laughs> By the time we get to Bass Pro Shop, buy a canoe. <laughs> Probably more than an hour it's going to go by. Hey, if you want to do that, dude, let's do here, it. We'll let's just, do it. Th those people, the family there. Here, let's just come, come here. Come here. Hey, uh, hey, hey, uh, Miss, Miss, uh, Mrs. Yes. Uh, how, um, how much? Know, how much for your your kayak there? How much for that? Oh, I'm. You, you want to buy my I wanna, kayak? I want to buy your kayak. I can't wait an hour to get out with those fish. They're calling me, and I want. I will. I will pay. $300 for that kayak right now. $300 for this kayak? Well, look, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I like coming out kind of by myself and just getting out in nature with the kayak and all. But um, I actually got this as a gift. And $300 is actually, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to, you, sir, you can buy my kayak. The way we're going to do this is uh, you're going to give me the kayak. And uh, I'm going to have to get cash from the machine in an hour when they open it. So uh, I'm just going to take it out right now. I, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I don't know. Hold on. You don't just take my kayak without paying I mean, you can it. hold on to uh, my uh, jacket as collateral. How about your driver's license as collateral? Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. So so we're going to, we'll take the kayak out. You got my driver's license and then I'll bring the kayak back and either I will pay you or I will have decided that the kayak does not fit my standards. And that uh, you will give me back my driver's license. No returnsies on a kayak. <laughs> Buddy, I don't know. What, what, what's your problem? Maybe I'm going to approach a different, a different person about this proposal. We're going to go for that. Bill, let's go, go, go flag down that family over there. You just, 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 just move on your way. Move on Can your I way. Can I help you? Uh, yeah. Sir, you, are you I, okay? I see you got a, a motorboat there. 
I'll give you this lady's kayak for that motorboat. Well, I kind of came out with my family. Gee, we're going to eat some lunch, have a little barbecue, do some motorboating. I mean, do you have to do it right now? It's just a fish. They're calling me. I can't wait. Oh, well. Oh, you know, I, I think that I think the place is opening now. I think we can just go rent one. Go down. You can rent one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I guess this uh, mad scheme to uh, trade boats among people until eventually you get a giant yacht or whatever is, is completely unnecessary because they've opened the open the show. Yeah, we can rent. We can rent a canoe now. You good? Let's go. Hey. Fuck them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> awesome. But that was great, Mark. That was, that was perfect. I, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's not a character that made any sense, but well, it doesn't. Well, that's just it. We can figure that out later. This whole notion of you know we'll decide what they mean and what they need as we go along. Well, we don't need to see their passport the moment they step on stage. We can decide who they are. But that would be one totally one school of thought. Does that make sense? Yes. I, I have... whatever you say, I'm going to take care of me first. And again, there are going to be instances and in shows just like music where. We need that to happen. The show will not work if you don't do that. But there are going to be other instances where perhaps, uh, you know, use with caution. That's just one example, how we can get some dissonance in these things. And I'm sure it's always good uh, when you say, you know, scene partner, the character you've been doing does not suit my purposes anymore. Be (laughs) someone else right now. You know what? I don't like that character either. Be someone else. Boy, I would love to see that. That would be hilarious. It seems you know that, what? It, it, improv timeout. Improv timeout. What the hell? What are you doing out there, man? You think this is funny? Is this being this loud, obnoxious guy? Is this funny? You know, to make that funny, I think you have to have three people. We only got two. It was really one and a half because the kayak thing like reached its natural conclusion. And then uh, joke structure, one, two, three. And then you could have the, the ending. So I apologize, Bill. Let's stop for some sponsor messages. Every day you decide who you're dressing up as. In your shirt, your jacket, your shoes, you're crafting a message to the world. And sometimes clothing's meaning can be surprising. Articles of Interest is a podcast about what we wear. It's a fashion podcast for people who are passionate about clothes and for people who think they don't care about clothes at all. Every other week, host Avery Truffleman reveals the wild stories hiding in your closet. Why do baby clothes have pockets? How did latex become taboo to wear? Can we actually know the labor conditions of garment factories? Is there such a thing as fashion separate from capitalism? Get articles of interest on your favorite podcast app. Would you like to take a philosophy course from me this fall? Learn more at partiallyexaminedlife.com slash class. You have done some musical recording, correct? I have done a lot of musical recording. Okay. What is the rules around what you can and can't tell supporting musicians can you be like play it let let me demonstrate for you how to play it and then you do it exactly as i demonstrated it or is that i would presume that's kind of gauche they mostly don't like that that's true (laughs) that's called line reading in the in the acting world say it like this that is considered inappropriate yes or is it different with person to person and there may be people who you trust to kind of take some liberties and some people you don't trust to take liberties right (laughs) i mean usually (laughs) just yeah, this is just something I learned as a as a young musician that initially, you know, it started in orchestras. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. like, yeah, that's what they do in orchestras. You give people parts mm-hmm. and then you're the conductor and you tell them how to do it. Sure. <laughs> and if they don't do it exactly right, because there's just too many people, you can't have the individuals expressing themselves in a way that is not <laughs> consonant with the group. But yes, in a smaller ensemble, there we go. I'm not yeah. paying you or I'm not your teacher or whatever. <laughs> then, uh, yeah, you probably are not going to put up with that shit from me. But I mean, don't you appreciate, I mean, at some point in the creative process, don't you want other people kind of bending some things here or there, you know, taking some liberties? I mean, it depends on the, what the, what game you're trying to play. Okay. If what you mean is you don't want people taking liberties with the kind of game you're playing, right? Is that, isn't that what you were just saying before that my first band I was in, in high school, it just seemed this guy had learned a bunch of Chuck Berry riffs. And I'm like, I don't, this is not a Chuck Berry song. It sounds nothing like Chuck Berry. Why are you putting Chuck Berry riffs over this kind of mellow song? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can give stylistic instructions. Please stay within this realm. Yes. This is kind of a slow, folky. I've got a folky thing in mind. Can we keep it there first? You know? Right. And people will try to live within those parameters. And then... 
as in the the film That Thing You Do, the drummer says, nah, we're going to play this song fast because your idea sucks for a slow song. And we're going to have a major hit that's going to cover the entire United States and Tom Hanks is going to be our friend. <laughs> and they do. That thing they did happened. As, I, I really as, like that first scene where the drummer speaks up and says exactly what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That film. Well, the audience knew what was going on. That's that's for sure. That's, it brought them along. <laughs> it's probably important in every improv scene to just, you know, stop a minute and really spell out where this is going. You know, as a person who irrationally can't wait an hour to go in the water, I'm going to waste time talking to these people until an hour has passed, and then <laughs> the problem will solve itself. If I just said that at the very beginning. We've talked about it a little bit, but disagreeable people. Do the ancients, do they have some opinions on disagree? The ancients were never disagreeable. <laughs> but do they have some opinions on disagreeable people? Yeah, they're, they're bad. Not to put you on the spot. Okay, they're, they're bad. bad. It depends which ancients you're talking about. Some of them, I think we sort of covered this in our competition episode, but you could have uh, Heraclitus. The whole, the whole universe is held together by strife, is held together by competing interests, which you could apply to today's political landscape or maybe not today's because today's is fucked up but you know a normal <laughs> adversarial political landscape where you know you need people working against each other because that's what keeps the system moving up the, the, the tension itself yes the tension is actually good slava zizek one of the most famous the world's famous and crazy ass philosophers today when hillary was running against that trump was like you know if Hillary wins, it's, it's everybody agrees. It's like, it's, you know, there's only one foreign policy. It's, it's a, so he didn't come out and say vote for Trump. He's not an American. He couldn't vote at all, but mm -hmm. he was enough that he got some shit about that <laughs> after, <laughs> after that happened. How could you possibly say anything that was not completely on message with making sure Trump does not happen? Well, what, so what's wrong with the, I mean, is, isn't with more tension, hold the society together better than less tension? I mean, it seems there has to be an ideal amount. What does too little or too much tension look like? Or in a partnership, Lennon-McCartney, you know, that having this sort of competition. I know I've been in bands with co-leaders. Sure. And that's actually very good for me because it actually gets me to write another song. Sure. When yeah, then yeah. finally I have enough songs and you're shooting down half of them and you're... <laughs> want to fit your crappy songs that are not as good as buying in there, then it's no longer working. But, yeah. you know, as long as ever there's mutual respect. I mean, I think that was the, yes, the respectable, honorable enemies thing that we were talking about in our competition episode. I think there's also that whole notion of like, you know, when the Beatles are first starting out, neither Lennon nor McCartney could have gone it alone. Like their best bet was to mm -hmm. stick it out. But then as their careers go along, it's like I could just pick up the phone right now and get a record deal for a solo album just like you know it is done i can have that done in an hour and it's like knowing that that is true makes you like do i have to put up with this guy i think that's though among the ancients it's very <laughs> much a minority position that tension is good that oh. you should ultimately work everything out so to sort of take it back to the we can work it the, out the sole creator that's ultimately sort of what what happened is that they you know, couldn't but it was even the, the latter half of their career, it was a Lennon song or a McCartney song that the other one would quality control. And sure. that's a totally legitimate compositional way of putting things together. I don't, I don't know how I'd feel about as the dual accountants writing our novel together. <laughs> uh, if I do 90% of it and you just kind of edit it, you just check it over and then we have to put our names together. But, it, you know, it depends on the political situation you're in. That might be necessary. Fair enough, fair enough, yeah. <laughs> if you were the established artist, if, if you're Elvis and I'm writing a song for you, mm -hmm. then actually you get to, you get to be a co-writer. You're not really a co-writer, but maybe you, uh, the Fleetwood Mac big 80s album, I think the song Seven Wonders, Stevie Nicks did not write, but she misinterpreted one of the lines and kind of turned it into something else. So, hey, she's a co-writer. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Well, that happens at in commercial auditions. They'll usually give you your lines, your side, your lines, mm -hmm. you know, for some, hey, some, it's some bank and they want to do some campaign where there's some wacky guy or going around the bank harassing people, you know, fr night friendly harassing people, friendly harassing people. And they'll have some sides for you and like, hey, just go around and start 
asking people, you know, how much money, how much money you got? You just use silly things like that. But then they'll say afterwards, okay, if you have any, if you want to riff out some ideas, that's great. And the whole notion is that like, are they harvesting ideas? As an actor, you're like, oh, they like my stuff. They want me to, to riff out some ideas, but perhaps they're, you know, harvesting ideas, you know, better, right? Oh, there's one guy improvised this one thing that was really funny. We should take that and not credit them. I don't think they say the not credit them part. It doesn't even cross their mind. But there are forces in the acting community who always say respectfully decline any invitation to just riff a few out. Are you going to rob that bank? Do you got a gun? What kind of gun you got? They would, ne- they would never. Are you going to rob it right that's, now? That would be the worst campaign for a bank. That would be the absolute. Yeah. So that's why you just got to give them really bad ideas. and then <laughs> Exactly, yeah. I riffed a few. What are you going to do about it? Oh, you, no, no, we want good ideas. Oh, so it isn't about me, the actor. Huh, it's about my ideas. I get it. Are you going to do I a run it. on this bank? Yeah. yeah. I will race you. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's get yeah. who can get to the front first. That's what a run on the bank is, is you just push to the front of the line. Just yeah. saying. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you for being so cooperative. We'll make sure you never work again. <laughs> That's a very powerful agency. <laughs> yes. I'm sure the ancients understood nepotism. I mean, it's a Greek word, probably. But like so much of today's society, who you know and and who you're connected to and just all the levels and things and playing the game to succeed in a certain thing. Oh my gosh. You know, and that affects our motivation, doesn't it? Yeah. I think Alexander the Great was a Nepo baby from what I understand. (laughs) He was, wasn't he? I think think any hereditary (laughs) ruler. I mean, I guess Caligula was a Nepo baby too, if you want, you know, you want to play that game. But he really, you know, established himself with his debauchery. He wasn't relying on the debauchery of his ancestors. I think he was kind of the first, I think, you know, I mean, they had probably, maybe they had stories of when they were, had kings being debaucherous, but they'd have been that Republic for so long. They probably, it's been a while since like, wow, we got a real nasty guy. I mean, it's not like that Nero too, who is like, I'm going to play my flute while I burn something. I get the order of a mixed up sometimes. The order of all two hundred emperors, which I can usually rattle off. I mean, I, that's why. That's why. <laughs> oh, ninety three percent accurate. Usually, it's just Nero, Nero two, Nero three. It's that kind of thing. They yeah, do yeah. that to make it easier for historians yeah. to remember. Yeah, you got your Caesar, and you got your Augustus, and you got everybody. You got else. your Caesar. Let's, let's you got be your frank. Caesar two. You got everybody else. There's probably been Caesar three, Mussolini, or somebody being like, "Hey, I'm Caesar three. Like, is that a thing? Czar is, is from Caesar and Kaiser oh, is from it, Caesar. That makes it yeah. really complicated though. How can you, <laughs> we need a single, a single line? Who single is the, line. Which is the true salad. Let's talk about salads again. We don't need to do that. So sir, what you'll do is you'll just grab your plate and then you can just take anything you want. Anything you want from the, from the salad bar there. Just there's little tongs and just go crazy. Go crazy? Let's have anything you want. It's a salad bar. Have you not been to a salad bar before? You look a little confused. I just, I didn't know I could go crazy. Well, I mean. <laughs> I'm just speaking kind of being silly. Take whatever you like, and you can, if you fill up your plate, that's fine. You can always go back and get a new plate. Always go back and get a new plate. That's fine. As much as you like. All right. What about my brother who is, hello, I'm his brother. See, that's actually not a different person. Like, as if like you were, I was in a scene and there were two actors. That's me having multiple personality disorder because I'm pathologizing multiple personality disorder. Can we go back to the scene, please? Dissociated. Can we we time in? Can we get back to the scene now? I'm in the scene. I'm I'm speaking in character. Oh, okay. (laughs) Look, sir, it's just a salad bar. I don't know if you've been to a salad bar before, but just uh, you know, have it. Take all you want. You and whoever else would like to have some salad may have some salad. I was trying to get crazy with the salad bar by getting meta with the salad (laughs) bar. Is that? Can I take the bar itself? And become a full lawyer right here at the bar. The mere idea that you're agreeing to my conceit that this guy has never been to a salad bar before, doesn't understand how salad bars work. No, I'm still work. talking in character. Are you, are you breaking out of the I am scene? in character also. I am in character also. I was thinking of using the bar like a parallel, parallel bars. Can I do that at the salad bar? As long as you don't violate the sneeze guard area, that's totally okay. fine. I mean, it would be crazy to violate the sneeze guard. And I, I believe per the, uh, the earlier contractual agreement, I may go crazy at the salad bar. I think I have that. That, on, that, that was on, not a contractual we agreement. We recorded that. that? A, a colloquial expression not to be taken literally. Are you saying that ironically? Not to be taken literally? Because Are you hungry? Are you hungry? 
Did you come I, here because I, you were I, hungry? I thought I was hungry, but now I'm hungry. I got to Those fish are calling me. If you'd, li- if you'd like a refund, sir, is, we, a refund there, can be provided. Is there fish in the salad bar? There is some tuna salad. I mean, that's not really. I, I mean, mean, fish. R- it's got grapes. You like grapes in your tuna salad? Green grapes? Ah, and wiggling. See, that's going crazy when you start to. That's this. That's a bad golem. I'm sorry. That's fine. There are people lined up behind you. I would love to help some of these customers behind you. Seven ninety nine, all you can eat salad bar. That's how this restaurant works. Everybody. It's on me. I'm going to be getting all of your salads. And I don't mean a seven and nine ninety nine for each of you. I mean, I'm going to just keep coming up and getting plate after plate. And uh, I will give it to the people around them. Well, the whole point of a salad bar is you get to pick what you want. You get to go to up and you get to load up with, you know, you want croutons. You don't want croutons. You want bacon bits. You want you know sesame seeds, two different kinds of lettuce. But, you know, it's part of that freedom and choice. I think people really appreciate at the sound bar. I suppose it's just, it feels so meaningless when you're just doing it for yourself. When you're only picking the thing that you want, it's like, I mean, don't you want to impose your desires on other people? Like <laughs> my salad desires? <laughs> Wouldn't that make you feel more, more powerful? More human? To be able to, to take uh, from others? I mean, I don't want to take. I want to give. I want to give. I want to take their freedom of choice. Yes. Well, okay. But I then. want to well, give that's... to them the physical salad. I will pay for it so long as I can impose my will upon them. It's presumptuous to feel that your will would match their wants and needs. I mean, do they even know what they want and need until they see something in front of them and then they can react to that? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a very convenient point of view for the person. Lady behind me, who doesn't have to talk if she doesn't want to, I will get you going on your salad because it's going to be on my tab. And as long as I'm the one collecting all the plates, right? It's still seven ninety nine, yeah. right? Even if I give the plates to everybody, there is sharing allowed. That's what you're saying? Yeah, go, go crazy. Once you're inside, go crazy. Oh, I said it again. I said it twice. <laughs> Once you're inside <laughs> and have your plate. All right. I only learned what I know about mental illness from Bugs Bunny ca- cartoons, but let's wrap this up. <laughs> okay. All right. And you and you are not Napoleon. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't see how that scene can be any more humiliating. So let's just be done. Are with you that. still in character? Are you no. still in character? I mean, I I don't know if it's possible <laughs> to exit this character in particular. This character is too meta. Yeah. Well, I think there were some Ayn Randian things in there, right? I mean, this whole notion of you know force of will, and it's like I mean, I, I agree that there are moments when individuals will victory or or simply having a choice being made is the right choice you know and and you're you're a parent and certainly you've got young kids and it's like the worst thing right now when you've got these young kids trying to figure out dinner and the first restaurant is closed we don't need a democracy right now we need you know it's like everybody's grouchy everybody's hungry we need one parent to step up and say, okay, we're going to lose, which is, um, in my mind, some family-friendly diner. You know? I, I mean, it's an unfortunate name by saying it that way. Yes. It's, yes. We're going to lose by going to lose. I mean, is that, that's just inviting. It's, yeah. It's not a good slogan. Well, it's, it's the restaurant where all the families end up when no one can agree. So everybody loses. Mm. Like, it's got on the poster. It's like, yeah, we know. The food's not very good. But we got something for everybody. When one kid wants a grilled cheese and the other one wants, uh, you know, fish sticks, it's like we're not going to find one place. Keep digging your feet in. We'll end up at Lou's. They've got everything. <laughs> this could be something, Mark. We may have just discovered the family restaurant that no one wants to go to, but everyone ends up at. I mean, is that the same with improv scenes, really? That we, you know, you have a bold idea and I have a bold idea. It peters out. It just melts down into something that nobody wants. <laughs> that, can, that can happen, I guess. I mean, that's not, I'm not saying that can't happen. <laughs> if you're, I guess if you're too responsive to the other person, as you were saying, that you got to make some bold choices. Well, it comes down to why are you here? Why are you on stage in the first place? Why are you doing this? What about this is fun? I mean, it's just that my father was an improviser and his father was an improviser. And I mean, my last name is <laughs> improviser. <laughs> Improvisier. I was. I was going to give some variation of it. But you know what I'm saying. You know, at, at some is, point, is there a Billy Improv? Is that a? Is that could that be your stage name? I, I'm Billy Improv. 
I could see there being like an Italian person with an improvio or something. You know, there's there being some kind of that root word showing up in a in a family name as a way to market yourself as a more effective improviser. I know the Arnett name is not immediately making everybody think of improv. I mean, since this podcast, yes, everybody as soon as they think <laughs> Arnett thinks improv. Yes. Yes, and Will Arnett, the actor, is losing market share in people's minds because of this podcast to me, the actor. I don't know why I never made the connection that you are your name has been ruined by... Yes, and vice versa. We'll, we'll see who can ruin whose name <laughs> the fastest. I'm going to get me too'd here just to, just to take him down, just to take him down a peg. <laughs> yeah, it's all just about who is higher in the Google... Somebody, a SEO person to consult with you so that your, <laughs> your articles about your horrible behavior come up first. Well, I would love to do like a documentary movie about a, a Bill Arnett convention and just invite all the Bill Arnett's out there. I do own BillArnett.com. I snagged that, scoop that up when I could. And there are some out there. There is an art professor. There is also an amateur astronomer out there as well. It's not. So unique a name that there aren't others. Not sure how many Mark Linson Myers are, there are out there. You you might know all of the other, <laughs> personally know all the other Mark Linson Myers out there. There's there's at least people can Google it if they want to find out the <laughs> yeah, shameful yeah, yeah. secrets of what the other Mark Linson Myers are doing. I probably told you about the other Mark Linson Myers that you know I found his obituary, but he went by his middle name. There you go. Well, yeah, which was improv, and, improv Linson Meyer and. So now I feel like I can't use that. Doubt it. <laughs> Yo, Marky Improv, come down to my, what about, see, that actually sort of works. Whereas it's Marky stand up. I'm going to come down to my, my set, the Marky, Marky laugh, Marky giggle boy. What's it? What's it? Good... If you're going to be Marky Improv or Marky stand up, you better be hitting home runs every time <laughs> at the bat. That's is really setting yourself up. It's like Daryl race car driver. It's like comes in third at the Indy 500. <laughs> You'd have thought he'd probably do a little better. Yeah. Mm. I mean, he's driving. He's, a, he's, he's made it to a high level. But I would think if you have the name, you've really done half the work. The first thing, if, like if you want to write a novel, is change your name to Billy Novelist mm -hmm. legally. And then, you know, you're, you're already so far on the way. Yeah. Hello. I'm Charles Successful Athlete. Uh, yes, whatever it is you do. Visualize your goals. <laughs> Name yourself after them. I think this is definitely a, a self-help thing that we can. You know, I was in a, a little short video series. It might be floating around on, out on the, on the YouTube somewhere about a high school guidance counselor, a inept high school guidance counselor. I think his first name was Bill, but it's spelled Wiener, but he said he insists it's Winner. Mm. So it's like, not wiener, it's wiener. But he is a wiener. That's the joke, is that he is a total wiener, but insists it's winner. And for a guidance counselor, you would much rather work with a winner than a wiener. I mean, a wiener might end up at Lou's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm telling that, that restaurant, oh, come on now, Mark, as a parent, as a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You end up at Plan C, you know? Yeah, I had that even before I had kids. <laughs> it was <it's> like... <laughs> Fine. It's fine. Just mad at you yourself. Can't agree just, on anything else. Fine. Yeah, it's you're by yourself, sir. I know. It was Chili's. That was what it was. <laughs> yeah, Chili's will. Chili's now we is, don't go to Chili. We haven't been to Chili's in 20 years. <laughs> so, well, I'll tell you what, they have now, they now have these little table talking about this whole idea about improv scenes tanking and why they tank. And you have to ask yourself, why are these people even here? What is your reason for stepping on stage? Is it to create something? Is it to have fun with other people? Is it self-aggrandizement? You know, there's a lot of, lot of reasons why people might, might do something. Well, our kids one day decided that they liked chilies, which was very surprising mm. to, to my wife and I, because it was a bit of a lose diner situation. And it's the kind of thing where we might be hungry for Mexican food or something kind of Southwesty, but like we have to, we have to go to the lowest bar because we know they're not going to have a grilled cheese sandwich at, at our favorite Mexican mm. places. So we, we end up like, oh boy, we're really taking a hit here, kids, just so you can get your chicken tender basket, you know, that they're not going to have at our favorite Mexican place. Anyway, at Chili's, they have this little video screen on the table, like a little uh, tablet computer. So you can order new drinks and order refills and contact people, but you can also play games and play these little games on the, it's like a buck and you can play unlimited games while you eat. And then it, but it took 
Hey, where should we go to dinner? Let's go to Chili's. Chili's, really? Yeah, it's great there. We love it there. Really? What do you love there? Everything. And it took like minutes of prying before they finally fessed up. We just want to play the little tablet computer games. It's like, we have games at home. We have all kinds of things. You know, we, we can just take your tablet to the nice Mexican restaurant. And you can just eat churros all day for all we care. But do we have to go to Chili's? Yeah, they got the computer screen. And is there a final, should we just put this one to bed <laughs> or is there a final <laughs> scene that would, have you gotten to illustrate your point? I think so. Have you got, well, you start, you got, you got some pretty heavy Ayn Rand stuff up top. I, I, there's no Ayn Rand. There's no Ayn Rand involved. There is. <laughs> is that, that kind of destructive chaos? Is that, you know what I'm saying? Could that be Ayn Randian in, in some regard or? No, I don't even want to spend time with Ayn Rand anymore. Uh, <laughs> I did bring her up, you know, and this is actually one of the the good things about Ayn Rand is the idea of the singular artist. At least it's something to consider whether there's something more organic when a single mind comes up with an idea. But of course, as we've learned with improv or if you've been in a musical group or whatever, you don't have to be that much of a jerk. There's more than one way to make art. But you had asked one of the last episodes I was talking about a Art just being a tissue of references, right? That's the okay. against the death of the author thesis by Roland Bart and other folks. And you were like, well, who are they reacting to? Well, I'm now reading the romantics. These guys, Schlegel, and there's another Schlegel, and there's Schiller, and there's a Schleiermacher. There's, there's a lot of S's. A lot of Germans. Okay. A lot of people with very similar names. And they were very into, this has all gotten too formalized. This has gotten, you know, you, you think that you've discovered the laws of aesthetics and this is the proper way to put things together and we must just imitate the classics or whatever. And so like in Dead Poet Society, where the Robin Williams character says, rip that part out of your book and throw it over your shoulder. Then these romantics came along and said, no, it is the individual one of Schle Friedrich Schlegel's quotes that was something like, every individual artist should be like somebody creating his own religion. So in a way, we're all shooting for the same thing, which is like, we talked last time about the overmind. I mean, that was sort of came out of romanticism is that okay, maybe okay. somehow what makes good art from bad art is it's divinely inspired. This is kind of, we're expressing this primordial unity that we as individuals have lost. And so that, you know, that can make it what, what is magical, good healing art versus just something that you did formulaically, even if it's all sort of shooting, perhaps in an abstract way to a common goal, it has to be an individual that takes it there and the individual style and the individual style is not separable from the content of what they have to say. Style is not just something you glom on to some content like a font. Sure. I can, I can appreciate that. I think there's something there, but I mean, also I can see it both ways. I mean, sometimes, what philosophy says, maybe we should be careful, empowering. <laughs> yes, lots of philosophy. Is, is, there, is there a philosophy? That, I mean, that, conserv that... conservatism is one of the things. Okay. Like, <laughs> once you get that, this is what cons good conservatism is, is, hey, you think you have a good idea? You're really then going to go and just impose that on everybody right now? Maybe, maybe we should slow down. Maybe <laughs> we should do a little it. more means testing. Maybe we should let people. Individuals work out their own stuff and, and okay. you know, instead of get their own salads together. Yeah. As long as it isn't to intentionally slow or stymie the rights of others, I guess, traditional conservative, philosophical conservatism, then maybe there are some merits in there. Right. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, overall, anybody who's sympathetic to Ayn Rand is going to say that is what it amounts to. It's allowing individuals to make their own choices and not imposing on, you know, and that's why. It fits yeah. so well with Rand Paul and other vaccines. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well. <laughs> yeah. No, that's in the news a lot. A little we bit. can put this baby to bed, Mark. We can put this. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming out with no guest. And uh, it's good to do these every once in a while. I think we have, we've, it's been a while since we talked without a guest on. So let's do some after talking here. Sure. In a minute. Yeah, folks can go to. You really got to the end of this episode. You really listened all the way there. Well, okay. If you want more, all right. Uh, it's uh, patreon.com slash philosophy improv. I learned a lot from you today, Bill. 
And I learned a lot from you today, Mark. And scene. If you enjoyed this, get more at philosophyimprov.com. If you're hearing this on the Partially Examined Life feed, please go subscribe directly to the Philosophy vs. Improv podcast so you won't miss any episodes. And you'll see our whole back catalog of episodes in that feed. While you're on the Apple Podcasts site subscribing, please leave a nice rating and review of this podcast. Better yet, avoid all the ads. Here are post-game discussions for nearly every episode and experience the video for this and most other recent episodes at patreon.com slash philosophy improv. Thanks so much for listening. Bankrupt. 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 Bankrupt.